Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Amy Spreeman. And I'm Michelle Leslie. This is part two of our review of The Chosen, a popular streaming program d- created by director Dallas Jenkins. Now, in part one of our review, we encouraged you, as we do now, to compare what we share here to Scripture, because that's really all that matters, not our personal opinions. We've linked up part one in our show notes, and, uh, and we'll warn you again, if you don't like spoilers, you'll want to wait until after you've finished watching seasons one and two of The Chosen to listen to our episodes on it, because this episode in particular that you're listening to right now has a lot of spoilers. It sure does, Michelle. And tonight in part two, we are going to review the content of the programming in season one and season two of The Chosen. But just to recap what we've covered so far in our first episode, we shared some concerns that we had about the background theology of Dallas Jenkins and the partnerships he has forged to create this series. We also shared some concerns about the merchandise, such as a devotional and a Bible study, which isn't a Bible study at all, but a study of the fictional shows themselves. So we encourage you to go back and listen. Now, two things we want to review that are deal breakers for many of us, including me. And again, take these red flags to the Lord and scripture. First, the partnering of Roman Catholic and Latter-day Saints or Mormon leaders in producing this series. We played a sound clip from uh, the YouTube channel of a Mormon man named David Snell, who interviewed Dallas Jenkins about why he thinks it's okay to partner with Mormons to produce a series on Jesus. And Dallas plainly stated that he believes that Mormons and Christians worship the same God. He said it twice, and he said that he would sink or swim by that statement. You will want to go back and listen to his words yourself. Folks, Mormonism is heresy. I I don't say that to be mean, but this system has created a very different Jesus and a very different gospel, which, of course, is counterfeit. I've written a white paper over at Berean Research on all the unbiblical, heretical beliefs of the LDS, and we're going to link that up in the show notes. Now, the other red flag we shared was that Jenkins was stating that God directly told him to produce this series, as in, thus saith the Lord. He has said that several times. Here's a soundbite from an interview he did with our friend Melissa Doherty. There's been movies and miniseries about Jesus, but like you don't have anything in your mind specifically about Simon Peter or Mary Magdalene. Like there's Mm -hmm. no visual in your mind. And I felt like God was saying like, this is going to be the definitive portrayal of my people. And this is what people are going to think of around the world when they think of my people. And I'm not going to let you screw it up. Well, Michelle, uh, what'd you think? Yeah, no. (laughs) Uh, You know, he, uh, I just don't even know what to say anymore. He has just said some... Uh, some things that are just really not biblical at all. And this is just another one. Uh, you know, I think this is really similar to the the clip that we played last time. And, you know, it says, he says, this is, this is going to be that God said to him that this is going to be the definitive portrayal of my people. And this is what people are going to think of, you know, when they think of my people, supposedly God is saying that. Well, that's just not true. The definitive portrayal of God's people is the Bible, not a movie, not a novel, not, you know, not anything else. So I, at this point, I just don't even know what to say anymore beyond that. And all these things that are going on behind the scenes are so troubling. And it seems like more and more is being revealed as time goes by. Now, as we said in part one of our review, we're not encouraging you to watch The Chosen, but we're not warning you away from it in the same sense that we'd warn you away from something like the heresy-saturated movie The Shack either, although that could happen in the future if it continues to get worse and worse like it has been. Uh, we might we might one day be warning you against it. Um, but what at this point, what we want to do is provide you with the information you need to pray about, think about, and use godly wisdom about whether or not you should watch this show. And just one more quick word about that. <clears throat> if you choose not to watch The Chosen, that's fine. And, and that's the wise biblical choice you've made for you. But just be careful that you're not unbiblically judging other brothers and sisters in Christ who have decided to watch it. Because I've seen some some comments on social media, some of them pretty 
vehement, some of them pretty angry, that approach or cross that line of unbiblical judgment. Watching the show may not be wise for some people, but it isn't sin unless they see something unbiblical in the show and believe it over scripture. So let's be careful how we treat others who have made a different choice in an area of Christian liberty, which this is, uh, people who've made a different choice than we have. And, and let's watch the attitude of our heart toward them. I know I have to, to watch the attitude of my heart um, uh, towards other people and in, in things like this. Okay, now we want to shift our focus to the actual content of the show. Now, last year in 2020, I wrote a detailed review of The Chosen after watching season one. Season two wasn't out at that time, but we don't have time to cover everything I addressed in that article. We really don't have time to cover everything we're addressing tonight. This is going to be kind of a long episode. But anyway, if you want more details on season one, uh, be sure to click on that article in the show notes and read it. And please understand, if you're listening to this episode far in the future, we are only covering seasons one and two of The Chosen tonight, because as of the day we're recording this, that's all that has been released. So overall, I thought seasons one and two of The Chosen was was pretty good biblically and cinematically. I mean, just talking about just the content of the show, uh, not all this other background stuff. For the most part, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but for the most part, it's true to Scripture when portraying something that is actually recorded in Scripture. But because the Bible doesn't give us all the details that are sometimes necessary to the flow of a movie or a TV show, The Chosen has to sort of fill in the blanks, so to speak, on things like I don't know, what the disciples talked about as they were walking from one town to another. Uh, You know, what was Nathaniel's occupation before he met Jesus? What did the guests say at the wedding at Cana? Things like that that aren't recorded for us in Scripture. So when they're filling in the blanks with these kinds of details, the, the writers were mostly, with a few exceptions, consistent with biblical principles and practices as well as first century Middle Eastern culture. There were a lot of things about The Chosen that I thought were pretty good, but for the sake of time, we're going to skip a lot of that and address some of the more problematic issues. So like I said, go to the show notes and read my review if you want more details. But overall, if I were grading The Chosen strictly on the content of the episodes, I would probably give season one a B or a B plus, and season two probably a B or a B minus, maybe a C plus, depending. Um... So one of the first problematic issues that I found with The Chosen was the way that Matthew is portrayed. In a couple of interviews with, um, with Dallas Jenkins that, that he gave, he mentioned that they decided to play Matthew as having Asperger's syndrome, which, if you're not familiar with it, is, is kind of like a mild form of autism. Now, this doesn't directly conflict with scripture outright, but I just find it really strange because there's no indication anywhere in the Bible that Matthew had any sort of disability. Dallas attributes this creative decision to the fact that Matthew is depicted in scripture as, quote, a numbers guy and, quote, meticulous, and because he chose a job that made him a social outcast. Well, Okay, but those things don't automatically point to the autism spectrum. The majority of people with those traits are not autistic. Yeah, that bothered me as well. The Real Bible says that Matthew would have been disliked because of his role as a a tax collector. And if you do a study on what this job entailed, you find that there's really a lot of opportunity for thievery and deception, you know, sin, (laughs) that was to be repented of. Uh, I knew something was kind of off about how this character was portraying Matthew differently. And when Dallas did this wrap-up interview at one point, he was really proud of how this interpretation brought a little color to the character of Matthew, except that Matthew isn't a storybook character. He is a real person. He was a real person with a real need for his sins to be forgiven. And he became, as we know, a huge God-given influence for the gospel of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, another thing, too, I could be way off base here, and this may not be what Dallas intended, but as a viewer, to me, it feels like the Asperger's aspect was added to Matthew's character either for the purpose of manufacturing diversity to appease an audience uh, that 
their worldly worldview centers around things like that, or to to be an inspiration to people on the autism spectrum, because Dallas did mention in one interview that one of his own children is autistic. But either way, if either of those reasons were actually the case, they're spiritually inappropriate, inappropriate motives when it comes to portraying anything biblical or, you know, really even just a historical character. We don't bend the Bible, even what might seem like an inconsequential detail, to make it more appealing to a particular audience. Yeah, I agree that diversity seemed to be the reason to go in this direction with the Matthew storyline. And for me, it throws the focus off of how the disciples were learning about Jesus and who he revealed himself to be during their time with him, which is really you know, what we read about in scripture. And then instead, it has us focus more on these made up storylines, these back character lines. And I have to wonder if now when people read the Gospel of Matthew, if they're not forever imagining his words coming from this television character with autism. Yeah, that's always possible. You never know. Okay, well, the next problematic issue came up in Season 1, Episode 5. And really, unless you have a Second Commandment beef with the entire show, I think this is the most glaring, ongoing, unbiblical issue of the whole series so far. And we touched on this a little bit last week when we were talking about the way The Chosen's devotional and the Bible study books portray Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene features prominently throughout The Chosen. Uh, as far as screen time, number of lines, things like that go, she is as major a character in the series as Peter and Matthew. So in season one, episode five, we see Mary Magdalene, a single woman unaccompanied by a close male relative, traveling on her first of many overnight trips with a bunch of men, several, you know, several of the disciples in Jesus, and they're traveling to the wedding at Cana in this particular episode. This is just so unlikely, just unlikely in the extreme. It would have been completely culturally, if not morally inappropriate, and her virtue and Jesus's intentions would have been impugned by others. If you remember the Roma Downey miniseries, The Bible, from several years ago, I think it, yeah, I think it was on the History Channel. I wrote a review of that at the time, and one of my main objections to that show was that the writers felt the need to appease a feminist American and, sadly, evangelical culture by elevating Mary Magdalene to the same position and level of personal and ministerial intimacy with Jesus as the Twelve Disciples, in essence, making her the Thirteenth Disciple. Yeah, I remember those. And in interviews with Roma Downey, she is very proud that she was able to be a voice for women and give them more prominence than scripture does. She wanted to make it more relatable to women. Michelle, I think the Bible relates to men and women just the way he breathed it out. Well, of course it does. You know why? Because God created women and all of God's ways are perfect. So he perfectly provided everything we need in his written word and it is the height of arrogance for any sinful man or woman to think he or she can improve on the perfect word of God. I mean, don't even get me started on that. <laughs> but getting back to the Bible miniseries and The Chosen, when I reviewed season one of The Chosen last year, I said I was concerned that The Chosen might elevate Mary Magdalene in the same way that the Bible miniseries did. And that is exactly what has happened as the series has progressed. In season two, the writers doubled down on this egalitarian aspect of the show by adding a second female, quote unquote, female disciple. Her name is uh, Rama, and she's a fictional character. And then also a third, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She shows up in one of the episodes of season two and starts traveling around with them like she's one of the 12 disciples too. And then in the final episode of season two, they add a fourth one. And this is another fictional character named Tamar. So who knows how many female disciples there will be in season three. I guess we'll have to wait and see. But having Mary Magdalene, and this goes for Rama and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Tamar too, having them constantly hovering around with the Twelve is not the way either of the Marys or the disciples are presented in the Gospels. If Mary had been as close to Jesus during his ministry years as, as uh, or if either one of those Marys had been that close to Jesus during his ministry years as the, what, the way they're portrayed in The Chosen, 
we would likely hear about that in the text of Scripture. But, of course, all this is not to say that Jesus didn't have any women followers at all. He definitely did. He sure did. Listen to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out and Joanna, the wife of Chuzza, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. So nobody's saying that Jesus didn't have female followers, just that they weren't equals with the twelve as the chosen portrays them. You see how it says, and also, there in verse 2, and the twelve were with him, and also some women. So there's a clear line of demarcation between uh, the twelve and Jesus's women followers. Right. When it came to Jesus's followers, there were sort of three levels or tiers of intimacy. There was the inner circle of intimacy with Jesus, which was Peter, James, and John. Then came the next closest circle, which would have been the remainder of the 12 disciples. And finally, there was a larger crowd of men and men and uh, some women also who followed Jesus regularly. And this last group is the group that both of the Marys and the other women who followed Jesus would have fallen into, not in the circle with the 12 disciples. You know, Jesus certainly elevated the general prestige and worth of women, but he did not elevate them to the position of social and cultural equality with men as American culture does. That would have been a stumbling block to nearly anyone observing or interacting with Jesus and would have been a major distraction from his ministry. Now, all of that being said, the chosen does depict Mary Magdalene, Rama, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Tamar as being soft-spoken, humble, meek, you know, all the character qualities that would be befitting women of their time and, and women of their culture, not as brash, raging feminazis. So at least, you know, I guess you could say that's a point in their favor. And then, you know, here's just something I found a little amusing in one of the episodes of season two, when Mary and Rama are discussing with either Matthew or Thomas, I can't remember, um, I can't remember which one of those it was, but they were discussing their desire to learn the scriptures with whoever it was. The writers had Rama say, almost as a disclaimer, we don't want to be teachers, we just want to learn more. <laughs> so that doesn't excuse portraying these women as functionally on par with the 12, but I did appreciate that they at least made that attempt to, to say that. Yeah, I noticed that also, Michelle, the way she humorously dismissed, I, I believe it was Thomas, who I think was her betrothed in this story anyway. Uh, so he kindly offered to answer any questions she might have about the scriptures, as a guy would do back in that culture. Um, Rayma and Mary Magdalene sort of looked at each other and smiled, and uh, Rayma says, I know, when uh, he made that offer. So uh, yeah, kind of snarky there. I also found it strange that Mary Magdalene's character could read and write scripture. She was seemingly just as learned as the disciples were who studied under the rabbis. And several times, this kind of got me, she questioned why women weren't allowed to do some of the things that men were allowed to do. Again, there's really no indication from scripture that the real Mary was like this. Um, another issue from episode one that caught my attention, it happened so quickly that some of you may have missed it. And I know, Michelle, this uh, caught your eye too, and you wrote about it in your review. Toward the end of the episode at the wedding at Cana, Simon and Jesus are kidding around about Andrew's lack of grace when it comes to dancing, you know, like he's got two left feet or whatever. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with showing Jesus and his disciples joking with each other from time to time. Uh, the way it was portrayed was brotherly and endearing and really in no way sinful. But here's the thing. During this playful conversation, Simon Peter asks Jesus to transform Andrew into a better dancer. And the words that the writers put into Jesus' mouth were, some things even I cannot do. So uh, in that context, I'm sure the writers merely meant to convey that Jesus was making a witty remark and that, in fact, it was not uh, part of his earthly mission to transform Andrew from a klutz into Fred Astaire. 
But I think, and again, this is just my opinion here, uh, that was really a poor choice of wording. It's contextually untrue because Jesus was certainly capable of making Andrew more graceful. And it's understandably um, a a way that it could offend Christians to hear a, a Jesus say that he's unable to do something. Yeah, I agree, Amy. When you're portraying Jesus, you've got to be extra careful, extra reverent, extra, uh, I don't want to say extra biblical, but uh, very biblical. Yeah, not extra biblical, but very biblical. Well, the next biblical issue arose during uh, episode six of season one, and it has to do with the portrayal of the story of the men who bring the paralytic to Jesus and lower him through the roof to be healed. You know, we all heard that story in Sunday school when we were little, so we're probably all familiar with it. The way the Chosen portrayed this incident, though, um, was not biblical. I mean, though men are the ones actually carrying the paralytic on a litter, a fictional character, Tamar, who's a woman and a self-described friend of the paralytic, leads the way. And it's made clear that this is all her idea to bring this paralytic to Jesus. And by the way, this is the same Tamar I just mentioned, who later goes on to become the fourth woman disciple at the end of season two. But anyway, back to the story of the paralytic. So Tamar, this woman, is leading the way, even though that's not what it says in Scripture. And when Simon Peter attempts to stop the entourage from pushing their way through the crowd to Jesus, Tamar is the one who pleads with him, and Mary Magdalene reproves him for trying to turn them away, which certainly would not have been her place in that culture. And then a few moments later, Tamar is the one who comes up with with the idea of going up to the roof, and Mary Magdalene assists her. And once the hole is made in the roof, Tamar calls down to Jesus and asks him to heal her friend. And then Jesus looks up through the hole in the roof and says to her, your faith is beautiful. Now, and yeah, this was a this was a big problem um, in in a lot the same way that the insertion of Asperger's into Matthew's character uh, was was clunky and just awkward. This kind of same clunky insertion of women into the biblical narrative where there are none feels like a blatant attempt to play to a 21st century feminist audience. And in this case, it does conflict with scripture. Well, Michelle, you are so graceful in your response. I I probably won't be here, but I found that scene (laughs) to be revolting. Uh, The women are heroes once again, girl power. Do you ever find yourself yelling at your TV? Yes. Yep, I know. (laughs) At that point, I was doing that because this was hugely problematic. The Luke 5 account of this story is very clear in verse 18 that men brought the paralytic to the place where Jesus was. Those men were the ones seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. And when it was impossible to get through the crowd, verse 19 tells us those same men were the ones who decided to go up to the the roof and let their friend down through the hole. And when they did, Jesus looked at those men in verse 20 and affirmed their faith. Now the writers have erased a faithful group of men from this story in order to exalt women. That's not being faithful to scripture. That's pushing an agenda, whether their own or the agenda of the segment of their audience that they were hoping to placate. Yeah, let's be clear. There's more than one way to be ashamed of the gospel and modernizing it to fit the world's sensibilities about diversity and feminine is, feminism is one of those ways. And I really hope that the Chosen's writers will recognize that whether they meant to or not, this is what they're doing and that they will correct their course in future episodes. I know it sounds harsh to say that this is a form of being ashamed of the gospel, but God takes his word very seriously, and we have no business changing it even slightly to appease the worldly. Yeah, we should also point out that at the very beginning of that very first episode of The Chosen, they flashed up a disclaimer on the screen which in part said this, All biblical and historical context and any artistic imagination are designed to support the truth and intention of the scriptures. How is artistically imagining women replacing men in this story supporting the truth and intention of scriptures? 
The truth of the scripture is that men brought the paralytic. The intention of the scripture is that men brought the paralytic. And because that is the truth, and scripture intends to tell us the truth, how is changing real men into fictional women supporting the truth of scripture? Yeah, I, I really would like to ask Dallas that question myself. Yeah, it's an absolutely fair question, and I, too, would be morbidly curious to hear Dallas Jenkins or whoever attempt to give a reasonable answer to it. And I have thought about that disclaimer many times throughout this show, and it just, um, you know, it doesn't match up. The disclaimer doesn't match up with what they're doing to Scripture, so I don't know that there's a good ex explanation for that. Now, I, I had said there were a lot of things I liked about The Chosen, but that I was going to skip most of that in order to address the more problematic issues. But <clears throat> I did want to give some attaboys to The Chosen for Season 1, Episode 8. When you watch it, you kind of get the feeling that the theme of this episode is like Jesus and the women or something like that would be the theme. Nicodemus gets the ball rolling by relating the story of Hagar's experience with God in the wilderness. And you'll remember from Genesis 16 that Hagar was the maid Sarai gave to Abram, Abram and Hagar became Ishmael's mother. Sarai ends up being abusive toward Hagar. Hagar flees into the wilderness and God meets her there and comforts her. Hagar calls him El Royi, you are a God who sees me. And that precious expression lays the foundation for Jesus to be that God who sees women, and indeed everyone, in this particular episode of The Chosen. Jesus' interaction with the women in this episode, uh, which would have been Peter's wife, Eden, Eden's mother, or Peter's mother-in-law, and the woman at the well, the, you know, his interactions with them were lovely, consistent with scripture, and exactly what we would imagine to be characteristic of Jesus. This type of interaction between the Jesus character and women is completely sufficient to, de to demonstrate Jesus' love for and value of women. There was no need for the writers to present Mary Magdalene and the other quote-unquote female disciples in a culturally inappropriate, stick-out-like-a-sore-thumb way in order to prove that point. I agree, Michelle. And you know, and, and one of the other scenes you mentioned, uh, Nicodemus there, and I, I can't remember if that was the same episode we just talked about or a different one in season one, because you know it's been a while for me, but just that scene with Jesus and N Nicodemus uh, as they're talking together, a lot of people felt uh, really touched by that in the same way. I just thought that was really well done. I thought, you know, just yes, that I scene agree. where he's learning, Nicodemus, who Jesus is is and i think when he realizes the, the truth uh but because of his position uh at least in the movie he doesn't follow right away but we know later from scriptures that nicodemus does indeed become a follower of christ so um I, even though it's an imagined scene um we know that the the truth of scripture is that he does love jesus in the end and uh, i did like that scene a lot yeah I did too. I did too. It, it really um, brought me to that feeling of, you know, how long the Jews had been waiting for their Messiah and gone through all of these, you know, terrible things, you know, even though a lot of it was because of their own sin, but had just gone through so much suffering and, and so many trials and everything. And just, you know, Nicodemus is standing there and here is the Messiah. And I just, that I felt like that was really touching. So... Another issue that started out in season one is barely noticeable and grew into a problem I think bears addressing from the very first episode of the show. It's made clear that Peter detests Matthew. Yeah, you know, I get that the Jews hated their brothers who betrayed them by joining forces with the Romans. They were regarded as traitors, and Matthew may have even personally cheated Peter's family as a tax collector. And I even get that Peter may have, have taken some time to warm up to Matthew and forgive him. But 
Peter's animosity toward Matthew in the show, which started in episode one and dragged on and on and on and on into season two, just gets worse and worse. And still, by the end of season two, still isn't resolved. And I just find it hard to believe that in real life, Jesus would have let this tension and bad blood continue among the disciples for so long. I mean, I'm I'm really waiting for the 70 times seven part. You know, how often do I have to forgive my brother 70 times seven? Because to me, this, this whole thing is just really unrealistic. And beyond that, it's really getting on my nerves. I mean, if I want to listen to boys argue, I can listen to my own sons. You know, <laughs> I don't need to watch that on TV. So, Well, and the point is that it was a completely made up conflict just for this program, for the purposes of adding drama to this episode, you know. Um, none of that animosity comes through in Scripture. I never saw Peter and Matthew in Scripture have any kind of words like that, like they have in the show. And, and it's really sad if if we're talking about Christ-like behavior. And I know Peter often stumbled in that area. Boy, that is definitely a place where he stumbled in the program where he didn't in Scripture. Yeah, definitely. All right, well, that pretty much wraps up uh, the issues we had with season one of The Chosen, but uh, we're just getting started <laughs> here, so let's talk about some of the issues in season two. Most of the problematic issues that started in season one just sort of carried over into season two. For example, the growing number of women disciples, like we mentioned, the animosity between Peter and Matthew, and Matthew's supposed autism. But there were some specific problematic issues in season two that we really need to talk about. There were a couple of scenes in season two, episode five, that Michelle and I saw a number of comments about and we agreed with. The first was a scene between Jesus and John the Baptist. Jesus and John have a vigorous discussion bordering on an argument. Jesus questions John's plan to get in Herod's face to confront him about uh, adultery. And John, in turn, essentially tells Jesus that he's not being confrontational enough in his ministry. And in the end, John does apologize and says, I'm just impatient for you to get to work. Yeah, I watched that scene and I thought, you know, Okay, John may have wondered and even asked Jesus why he seemed to be holding back somewhat if, in fact, that was the case whenever this conversation supposedly took place. But I strenuously doubt Mr. He must increase, I must decrease would have practically backtalked Jesus so impudently, basically telling Jesus he was wrong. I mean, I just don't see that happening. If anybody knows who Jesus is, I mean, really has a grasp of who he actually is, it's John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is not going to talk to the Son of God like that. I think you're right, Michelle. He wouldn't. In fact, it wasn't until John the Baptist was in Herod's prison that he expressed any kind of doubt. And even then, it was not disrespectful. Remember, he was the same man who, when he first saw Jesus at the river, said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You know, he was excited. He knew who Jesus was. But in prison, that horrible circumstance was where he was also faced with doubt. In his despair, he sent word to Jesus, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And what message did Jesus send back? Tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, that's a prophecy and a promise from the book of Isaiah, and uh, one that John would have remembered. So perhaps that message would have given John uh, the peace he needed for what was to come, and we know what was to come, and that was his, his death by beheading. Now, the other scene that was made much of was another one that was so brief that if you weren't paying attention, you may have missed it. Yeah, that's right. For about I mean, I gauged it at two and a half seconds, but it, it's probably about that long. Uh, Jesus is shown pacing around, sort of muttering to himself, apparently working on his sermon for the Sermon on the Mount. This seems this scene seemed pretty objectionable to some Christians, a few of whom vehemently declared this to be practically blasphemy because Jesus always knew the exact thing to say. But I'll be honest, I disagree with their assessment of the scene and with their outrage. So let me let me explain why. 
First, let me emphasize that I am not saying that Jesus ever said anything wrong or factually incorrect. Never, never, never. But we have to remember Jesus was both fully, truly, 100% human and fully, truly, 100% divine. And it's imperative that we believe both of those things. And, and in his true, uh, in his full, true, 100% humanity, there's really nothing that precludes Jesus thinking through his sermon and deciding things like, okay, here I want to word this sentence this way and that sentence that way. Or for the last audience I preached this sermon to, I didn't really need to explain this particular term, but I think I better explain it for tomorrow's audience, you know, because they might not understand it. Which, if you watch the scene closely, that's the kind of thing he was doing. He was he was carefully and intentionally choosing his words in preparation for speaking to the people, not wondering what he should say or practicing his sermon because he was afraid he wouldn't get it right or something like that. I watched the scene carefully three times, and that's, you know, from my perspective, that's what it looked like to me. Um, you know, and, and I thought, does God not purpose in his heart every word he speaks before he speaks it and every action he takes before he takes it? You know, God does everything purposefully. And it, it just seemed to me that that's what this scene was trying to convey about Jesus. Yeah, that's a really great take, Michelle. I didn't think about it like that before you said it, and I guess I always thought that his words would have been divinely inspired, you know, not just because he was divine, but because Jesus being eternal and being the Word, uh, he would have known as uh, you know, well ahead of time of uh, which eternal words needed to be said in that moment. So I appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Well, and you know, it's hard to tell sometimes because we we have to have that balance in our in our finite minds between Jesus being fully God and fully man at the same time. And that's that is an infinite eternal truth and state of being. And that's not something we can wrap our finite minds around. So, you know, sometimes, you know, we might kind of veer to one side, sometimes we might veer to the other side. But I just, that was kind of how it it struck me. And I understand that it probably struck other people some a different way, you know, and we're going to talk more about that in a, a few minutes when we come to another episode where he seems to be practicing uh, for the Sermon on the Mount. But that's, I just wanted to bring that perspective in. And, you know, that really brings me to another general issue I'd like to address. One of the objections a few people seem to have to The Chosen, or even to other movies depicting Jesus, is that Jesus isn't portrayed as walking around quoting scripture, so to speak, 24-7. Now, we know from John 21, 25, and just plain old common sense, that Jesus did and said far more than was ever recorded in scripture. And really, that goes for anybody's biography. Um, it's it's reasonable to assume that he had plenty of non-teaching, non-sinful conversations about mundane things like the weather, how's your mom and them doing, you know, and so on, things like that, or even important things that God didn't feel was necessary to put into Scripture. It's heretical to deny Jesus' divinity. That's That's called Arianism. That's a heresy called Arianism. But we need to be extremely careful that we're not accidentally stepping over the line into functional docetism. That's the heretical view that Jesus wasn't truly, fully, 100% human. You don't have to believe that the chosen is completely accurate when it fills in the blanks of Jesus' life where scripture is silent. I certainly don't believe that. I don't even think Dallas Jenkins believes that. But at the same time, you also can't say something like, for example, Jesus would never have made a humorous remark because the Bible never says that he did. Well, let's think about something just for an example. The Bible never says that Jesus went to the bathroom either, or that he spit up when he was a baby, or that he sneezed. But we know that he did all of those things because he was human, and that's what humans do. And it is just as reasonable to assume that he did and said all sorts of other normal, non-sinful things that human beings do and say, as long as we also assume that he did those things sinlessly. 
Yes, it is heresy to deny that Jesus was fully God, but it is also heresy to deny that Jesus was fully human. And I'm afraid for a few who object to the chosen, that might be a tiny little part of the reason without your even realizing it. I mean, nobody means to do this, but sometimes we can get so protective of Jesus's divinity, which is not a bad thing, but sometimes we can go get so protective of his divinity that we can perceive normal, non-sinful human behavior as a threat to that divinity. And we can't do that. That's heresy. It is okay. I mean, not just okay, but proactively good and necessary to let Jesus be a hundred percent human at the same time. He's a hundred percent God. That's the biblical way of seeing Jesus. It's called the hypostatic union. If, if we haven't thrown enough fancy theological terms at you tonight, um, so we've got to we've got to really be careful that we have a good balanced biblical view of Jesus when it comes to his deity and his humanity. Okay. Now, there were some issues in episodes 7 and 8 of season 2 that we want to cover. And the first one I particularly wanted to get Amy's perspective on because I'm having a little trouble totally crystallizing my thoughts on it. In yeah, in episode 7 There's a scene in which a local Roman official goes out to where Jesus and the disciples are camped out preparing for the Sermon on the Mount. And we'll get to more of that in just a minute. And and they arrest Jesus. I mean, they say, I think they make the point of saying that they're just detaining him, but it looks every bit like they're arresting him. And they take him, quote unquote, downtown, you know, for questioning. I mean, this wasn't some random soldier that was standing around and casually asked Jesus a question about his teaching. This was like, you know, official police business type stuff. I've got a problem with that. It, there, you know, there's nothing in scripture that I can find that says Jesus was ever arrested or detained and questioned by the Romans prior to the events surrounding his crucifixion. But the chosen shows a bunch of things happening to Jesus that aren't in scripture. And those don't bug me anywhere near as much as this does. Amy, why is this bothering me so much? <laughs> you know, maybe maybe because that's just stretching the b- biblical narrative too much. Or I don't know. Did that seem bother you? It did. You know, having just watched those last two episodes last night, uh, this is still really fresh in my mind. In fact, as they were arresting Jesus, and it it really was an arrest. You know, they told the disciples to lay down their weapons and step 10 cubits back. Uh, Jesus didn't resist. And he said he'd be back. And I'm, I'm thinking in this scene, where in the world is this going? Like, why is it in here? This actually does change the events of scripture. You know, like you, Michelle, I don't mind filling in some of the blanks with dialogue. But when you add a major event out of thin air, I do have a problem with that. And watching this scene made me very uncomfortable. I wanted to text you and say, "Ah, what am I watching? You know, but of course uh, I didn't. So um, all of this is leading up to the big event in the final episode, the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the scenes and the dialogue of the final two episodes focuses on uh, everyone preparing for the huge crowds and Jesus continuing to hone his speech. Um, Here's a couple of details that were added. The character of Matthew is shown taking notes and scribing Jesus' sermon. Jesus even asks Matthew for feedback during their writing sessions. So I guess if they're implying that this was how the book of Matthew was written, or at least uh, the Sermon on the Mount part, then this would contradict the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? And let me just add another observation along the same lines. Season two starts out with the Mary, Mother of God character and Jesus, the Apostle John, years after the resurrection, as John is beginning to write his gospel. The Mary in the movie is questioning, well, why would John need to do that? And she even then, after she accepts it, uh, suggests a few ideas. And at one point, John says, I like that. I will use that. So it wasn't the Holy Spirit there either, but I guess it was Mother Mary's idea. So anyway, uh, and then the disciples in the last episode were putting up advertisements for the Sermon on the Mount, and the way they talked about it sounded more like a stadium barn burner uh, than the way the Bible describes it. 
and of course it's mary magdalene who writes up all the flyers you know, she's the writer after all i mean she is actually writing the time and location details on little squares of stationery that are uh, perfectly formed and, and shaped and then handed out or nailed to telephone poles like they're advertising a garage sale and at that point i was just giggling because it was just so silly yeah it really was i mean the disciples advertising for the Sermon on the Mount, doubtful. I mean, the Bible depicts the throngs coming to him as a, as a result of word of mouth, you know. For example, in John 4, uh, come and see a man who told me all I ever did. You know, that's what the woman at the well said. In Luke 4, Jesus heals a demoniac in verse 37 says, and reports of him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And then really the the piece de resistance, I guess you could say, Matthew 4, 23 through 25. And these are the final verses before the Sermon on the Mount starts in Matthew 5. Listen to what this says. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And listen to this. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Ju Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Jesus was the most amazing person who ever, ever, ever lived word about him got around they didn't have to advertise yeah and they even built a stage with curtains from what looked like an architectural drawing or two and then the women each brought him different colors of material and fabric and after putting up an argument that he didn't care what he looked like he had them pick just the right color for his stage debut yeah like little uh I don't know. I was calling them serapes. I know that's Mexican, but <laughs> that's that's kind of what they looked like. You know, the these four quote unquote women disciples fussing about Jesus wardrobe and Jesus saying, I cannot tell you how much I don't care about this. I mean, come on. This is a great demonstration of just one of the general differences between men and women and proof of exactly why there weren't any women at this level of ministerial intimacy with Jesus. This kind of thing would have been a distraction. I mean, in the scene, Jesus' mother interrupts him for this stupidity as he's trying to focus on what he's go going to be preaching to these people. And that whole big stage with the curtains they built for him to preach from, I mean, at first it just... It just made me roll my eyes. I mean, it reminded me, if you've ever watched, uh, like, on the Biography Channel or a documentary of, of a rock star, and you watch it on TV, and especially the part where, you know, they're they're walking down, I guess you would call it a gauntlet, but they're walking to the stage, and they're just surrounded on every side by fans and adoring, you know, sycophants or whatever, and that's what it reminded me of, where Jesus is sort of walking this gauntlet of the adoring disciples on his way up to the stage in slow motion, you know. I half expected to see him high-fiving them along the way. But, you know, I, I watched it, and I tried to think about it fairly and think, you know, is there anything uh, in Scripture that would have actually precluded there from, from being a stage? And yeah, there actually is. Matthew 5, 1, right before Jesus launches into the Beatitudes, here's what it says. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. He sat down on the side of a mountain. Okay, maybe he sat down on a nice rock or something, but he didn't walk out onto a stage. And you know, this just also further demonstrates that there was no need to advertise the Sermon on the Mount. Because remember those verses I just read a second ago from the end of Matthew 4. Let me read the last verse of chapter 4 again with the first verse of chapter 5. And then um, immediately following that is when Jesus starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount. So this is 425 says, And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And then 5.1 says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. The crowds were already there following him. 
That's why he went up on the mountain and sat down to teach, to get above the crowd so they could see him and hear him. And there was, listen, also, there was none of this business about the disciples negotiating with a landowner for the use of his field or the use of his mountain or anything like that, like they show earlier in the episode. That, no, that didn't happen. We can tell from this passage right here. The crowds were following Jesus. He turned around and saw them. There was a mountain handy, so he went up it and sat down to teach, which also means he didn't have this big, long, protracted time of running the entire sermon by Matthew, getting his input, changing things around and all of that. You know, some a few moments of Jesus carefully pondering his words like we talked about before. Okay, I can go with you there. But this big protracted powwow with Matthew, no. And then... (laughs) <laughs> the last, the straw that just broke the camel's back for me in episode eight, as he's getting ready for the Sermon on the Mount, backstage, by the way, as he's getting ready for the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, he's talking to his mother, and it's it's actually a very tender scene, which is nice and everything, um, but she says, I'm proud of you, and that's, you know, certainly something Mary may have said many times to Jesus, so that's that's not a problem, but then the words that the writers put in the mouth of the Jesus character, he says, after she says, I'm proud of you, he says, maybe wait to say that until after I'm done in case I mess up in front of such a big crowd. Uh -uh, Uh-uh, uh-uh, no, no way. The Chosen is off the reservation at this point. I mean, before we were talking about being careful not to let Jesus's deity override his humanity, but here the chosen is allowing Jesus's humanity to override his deity. When it came to his teaching, Jesus would never have messed up and he would never have entertained the idea of messing up because he knew he would not mess up. I just, I just about came out the box on that one. I mean, I was fit to be tied yeah, do you have any Yeah, do you have any thoughts on those last scenes or any other final thoughts? Well, yeah, that was just again another head shaker. Yeah. Yeah, you had mentioned the two guys who are negotiating with the landowner for the use of his field for that stage setup. One of the guys ends up spoil alert, well the whole podcast yeah. is a spoiler <laughs> alert, but uh one of those guys ends up being Judas. And uh, Judas Iscariot, who who will eventually betray Jesus. And so this guy turns out to have a moral compass. And you know he doesn't want to rip anybody off. And he feels bad about how, you know, we've got a lower price from dealing with that land through deception. uh, And they should have done this, blah, blah, blah. Well, it it looks like a really nice guy that's playing him, you know. So there's going to be setting this up for season three, I imagine. Um. Overall, Michelle, I would say that The Chosen is extremely well produced. It's beautifully done, a lot of good photography and cinematography, but it's not the authentic Jesus from Scripture, even though Dallas Jenkins says that uh, it is the authentic Jesus. Uh, You know, he's added a lot of scenes. Um, Some are harmless filler, like we've mentioned, and some have skewed scripture. So it's basically fan fiction. That's how we need to look at it as Christians, in my opinion. Um, And y'all did ask my opinion. So this is not a series I would recommend bringing into the church or for a small group Bible study or anything like that. In fact, I also wouldn't recommend it for anyone who is impressionable and not being able to discern fantasy from truth, Uh, such as small children. I I wouldn't have them watch this. But um, even if you're an individual or a a, a grown-up who is discerning and you wanted to watch it knowing that there are red flags and uh, knowing that there are some unbiblical scenes and knowing that the director believes that Christians and Mormons worship the same God and that he has partnered on this project with those of other faiths, that, um, I'm surmising, would be between you and the Lord. So I'm just going to play it like that. Yeah, I would totally agree with you, Amy. This is this is not appropriate uh, material to use for a Bible study, like we talked about in the last episode. And I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest showing it in church either, because you know, in church, the the command to pastors is to preach the word, and this is not the word. This is like you said, it's a fanfic, and I wouldn't. Uh, 
I wouldn't even suggest even new Christians or especially Christian new Christians who don't have uh, very much knowledge of the Bible. I would I would keep it away from them as well, just to you know because they need to be grounded in what the Word actually says. You know what I've suggested on uh, I would suggest it with this, and I've suggested it with some other. Um, I think movies and TV shows and things like that is maybe use this with your Bible open in your lap to hone your discernment skills. Um, you know, whenever you you see a scene in the movie, watch the scene, put it on pause and look up wherever this is supposed to be in scripture and see what scripture really says about it and, uh, and use it to, to sharpen your senses of discernment. Uh, it could be a useful tool in in that way so yeah i think that fads like this will come and go you know maybe many years from now we won't be talking about this anymore it'll be kind of relegated to the archives but you know being discerning is important and so i agree with you we have to have our bibles open make sure we know the real jesus from the fan fiction one that is important And the other thing I'm wondering out loud is, how will this series that's so enormously popular right now, how will this impact the visible church by those who are bringing it in, those who are believing that, yeah, maybe it did happen this way, and then they're starting to believe the unbiblical scenes, they're getting confused. And so I'm wondering about that because, you know, the the Purpose Driven Life years ago Mm -hmm. did the same thing, and people were really impacted. Yeah, It skewed their view of our Savior and the gospel, and so I'm just thinking about that. Yeah, you know, I'm as you're saying that, I'm thinking about this has been viewed multiple millions of times all over the world and probably in some areas where people don't have as much access to the Bible as we do. And I'm concerned that people in uh, Bible poor areas are watching this and thinking that it is the Bible and not having anything to compare it with. So uh, I hope that is not the case, but... Uh, Yeah, I guess that could be happening. That would be dangerous. It is in many different languages. And if you look on the app, you can listen to it in different languages or watch subtitles or watch subtitles in just about any language imaginable. So I think you're right, Michelle. And the other thing I noticed was how many people in social media around the world, they've got thousands and thousands of comments now uh, over The Chosen, and and people are saying, oh, my church Mm -hmm. is doing this, or or, we're bringing it in. We're watching the movie uh, for family movie night at church, or uh, we're doing the Bible study together in my small group. Which is is really, you know, it's it's not the Bible. They're, they no, watch an episode to prepare for that week's topic, which is not a Bible study. It's an episode study, and then you know they they quote that, um, but it's not a Bible study. So, yeah, there will be an impact, and I think we as believers who are discerning need to just continue to point people to the real Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And if your church is bringing this in, uh, maybe have a little talk with your pastor and uh, maybe even let him listen to these podcast episodes. He might not even be aware of of what's going on that's in the in the show that's unbiblical. So maybe give him a a loving, kind, gentle heads up and let him know about that. Well, we hope you enjoyed our little review of The Chosen, or our big review, I guess it was, and that it was helpful to you in thinking through some of the biblical issues associated with the show. Again, we want to emphasize, if it goes against your conscience to watch The Chosen, that's certainly understandable, and we would encourage you not to violate your conscience. We've also got plenty of good resources for you in the show notes, so be sure to check those out. Yes, and next week we are going to stay on this topic because we have a feeling that many of you would like to share your thoughts on the series on any scene that caught your attention that we may have missed in our review or on whether you would recommend this series to others. We're going to read your comments on our next podcast. You can share those with us on our social media or email us, which you can find that address on our website, a awordfitlyspoken.life. And uh, while you're there, consider supporting our ministry via PayPal or Patreon to help with the production and website costs. We sure appreciate the help. We sure do. And until next time, don't get your theology from TV or the movies. Get into God's Word, get your theology from the Bible, and walk worthy. 